This is the city, Los Angeles, California. It used to be the only culture here was found in yeast cans. That time has passed. A city has grown out of a frontier town. Today, the Los Angeles Music Center stands where adobes once clustered. This breathtaking three-theater complex competes with the finest performing artists for the undivided attention of a generous patronage. Unified by landscape malls and underground parking, each theater is dedicated to a different cultural experience. The Dorothy Chandler Pavilion is home for the Philharmonic Orchestra. While experimental drama is an unswerving commitment at the Mark Taper Forum, only established works of wide appeal can be seen at the Amundsen Theater. For those who like their culture outdoors, there's the Hollywood Bowl or the Greek Theater. Los Angeles has grown up culture has flowered where mesquite once bloomed. There's also crime. That's where I come in. I carry a badge. The story you are about to see is true. The names have been changed to protect the innocent. Thursday, March 13th. It was warm in Los Angeles. We were working the day watch out of burglary auto theft division. The boss is Captain Kenneth Green. My partner's Bill Gannon. My name's Friday. Most people think of police officers writing traffic citations, investigating crimes, making arrests, and enforcing the law in general. But his job doesn't end there. Just as important is the officer's appearance in a courtroom as a witness. Without his testimony, there can be no conviction. Several months ago, we had arrested three suspects for burglary from auto. We checked in with Bob Simmons, the deputy district attorney who would prosecute the case. Yes, are you gonna bring the comparisons over? Right, I talked to Don Hale about a half an hour ago, told him we'd call him when we need him. We contacted the rest of the witnesses, all except one, this Carl Balanzi, he's out of town. The parking lot attendant. Yeah, according to his mother, his car broke down in Mojave last night on his way home. He said he'd try to make it back in time for the trial, but he hasn't shown up yet. Which reminds me, I better check with the office. He could be on his way over now. Talk to Lieutenant Walters, will you? I told him we'd be checking in. You can use the phone on the bailiff's desk. Right. Well, Sergeant, I think we're in trouble. We need Balanzi's testimony for probable cause. Without it, the defense can get the case thrown out. Yes, sir, I guess there's always that possibility. Didn't you have something in your report about a traffic violation? Yeah, the suspects drove through a red light right after we came out of the parking lot. According to your report, you were about a block away. It's thin, but it may be all we have. And it's bound to raise a question of search and seizure. It'd give us probable cause. Dan Mungold's a sharp lawyer. You and your partner could be in for a rough time on cross. You yeah, understand he has a habit of winning his cases. Dan's good. I'd like to have his record. No luck, Joe. All rise and face the flag. Recognizing the principles for which it stands, Department 121 of the Superior Court of the County of Los Angeles is now in session. The Honorable Birch Donahue, judge presiding. Be seated, please. Please be seated and come to order. Morning, Mr. Simmons, Mr. Mongol. Nice to have you with us again. Thank you, Your Honor. Good morning, Your Honor. Are counsel ready to proceed with the matter of the people versus Acosta, Williams, and Andrews? The people are ready, Your Honor. Your Honor, the defense is ready. Your Honor, one of the prosecution's witnesses hasn't arrived as yet, a Mr. Carl Balanzi. With the court's permission, however, the people are ready to proceed, subject to the stipulation that this witness may be called out of turn. Do you expect him, Mr. Simmons? Yes, Your Honor, I do. Mr. Balanzi went out of town for the weekend and developed car trouble on the way home. His mother expects him at any time. Your Honor, as I understand it, the people's entire case is based on the testimony of Mr. Balanzi. Now, without him, it doesn't appear they're ready to proceed at all. Would the defense be willing to submit the matter on the transcript of the preliminary hearing then, or agree to a continuance until we can produce Mr. Balanzi? Well, the defense could hardly agree to either. In all fairness to the defendants, they are here and ready for trial. 
Now, if the people are unable to produce this witness, I would ask the court at this time for a dismissal of the charges in this matter, Your Honor. Your Honor, Mr. Balanzi is an essential witness to show probable cause. However, the people are willing to proceed with the case and let the court decide on the matter, based on the evidence offered, with the stipulation that Mr. Balanzi may be heard out of turn. Very well, Mr. Simmons. If you're reasonably sure that your witness will appear, I see no reason he can't be taken out of turn. However, in all fairness, only up to the time the people rest their case. Mr. Mungle, I see from your petition that you wish to try these matters as companion cases. Are you representing all three of the defendants? Yes, Your Honor, I am. The charges alleged in this matter center around the defendant's activities while in each other's company on the night in question. I ask the court to apply the evidence received to all of the defendants equally. Does the district attorney have any objection? Mr. Mungle and I have already discussed the matter, Your Honor. The people have no objection. And may the record show that the defense has agreed to dispense with its right to trial by jury and the reading of the complaint and have agreed to be tried by the court. Defense joins, Your Honor. Let the record so indicate. Very well, Mr. Simmons, you may call your first witness. The people call Dr. Jack Patterson. Raise your right hand, please. Do you solemnly swear the testimony you're about to give in the matter now pending before this court is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Is Jack Patterson your true name? Yes. Be seated, please. Dr. Patterson, are you a dentist here in Los Angeles? Yes, sir. The doctor, would you please tell the court where you were on the evening of December 14th of last year? Yes, I was at the sports center that night. My two boys and I went there to see a basketball game. Did you drive your car that evening, sir? Yes, I drove my car. And where did you park your car when you arrived at the sports center? Across the street in the parking lot near Santa Barbara and Figueroa. Did you lock your car that night, doctor? Yes, I did. I remember locking it because my older boy's always kidding me about forgetting to take the keys out of the ignition. I see. Now tell me, doctor, did you notice anything different about your car when you returned to it that evening after the game? I sure did. The window on the driver's side had been broken out. Was there anything missing from your car? Yes, there was. My stereo was gone, and about a dozen or more tapes were missing from the glove compartment. Did you report this fact to the police? I started to, but Mrs. Chambers had already called them, and they were on the way. Her car wind had been broken, too. Thank you, Doctor. Nothing further, Your Honor. Mr. Mungle? No questions, Your Honor. The witness is excused. Your Honor, the people call Mrs. Gloria Chambers. Now then, Mrs. Chambers, you say when you came back to your car, you found the window on the driver's side had been broken. I did not say it had been broken, young man. I said it had been smashed. Yes, ma'am. And had you locked your car that evening? Of course I locked it. I always lock my car. I read the posters put out by the police department. Mrs. Chambers, did you report the fact that your car window had been smashed to the police? You know very well I did, young man. The two officers who came out are sitting right there beside you. And exactly what was it you reported to the officers? I told them just what happened that someone, or some group of people, had been going around smashing the windows out of innocent people's cars. It was shocking. You would think that those young men would have more consideration for someone else's property. Are you referring to the officers? Of course not. Those three men over there, they did it. Your Honor. Sustained. Witness last remark will be stricken from the record. I have nothing further, Your Honor. You wish to cross-examine, Mr. Mungle? No questions, Your Honor. Witness is excused. Thank you, Judge. Gentlemen, it's noon. If there are no objections, I think this is a good place to recess. No objection, Your Honor. No objection. Very well, then. This court's recessed till 1.30 this afternoon. Well, now, looks like you people are having a bit of bad luck. That witness of yours hasn't shown up. Yeah. Well, it's time for lunch. Or aren't you gentlemen eating today? At 1.30 p.m. when the trial of Ray Acosta, Marvin Williams, and Robert Andrews reconvened. During the noon recess, Bill and I drove out to the Balanzi residence in West Los Angeles. Carl still had not returned home. He had called his mother again from Mojave to tell her that his car was overheating, but he would do his best to get back to Los Angeles as soon as possible. Sergeant Friday, will you tell the court what your assignment is, please? Yes, sir. I'm assigned to Burglary Auto Theft Division. And were you so assigned on the night of December 14th of last year? Yes, sir, I was. Will you please tell the court what you were doing and where you were on that night? Officer Gannon and I were working the night watch on special assignment out of burglary auto theft division. 
We'd received a call that evening that several burglaries had been committed in one of the parking lots near the sports center. We went there to investigate. Where were you at approximately 11.40 that same evening? We had just left the parking lot near the intersection of Santa Barbara Avenue and Figueroa Street. Was this the same parking lot described earlier by the witnesses we've already heard? Yes, sir. Sergeant, will you tell the court exactly what happened when you and Officer Gannon left the lot? Did you have an occasion to see the defendants at that time? Yes, sir, I did. As we pulled out onto Santa Barbara Avenue, I noticed a light blue 1968 Chevrolet just ahead of us in the number three lane approaching Figueroa Street. The signal light for the east-west traffic was red at the time. The Chevrolet made a right turn onto Figueroa without coming to a complete stop as required by section 21453 of the vehicle code. Did you pull the car over at that time? We attempted to stop the car by displaying a red light and sounding our horn, but it wasn't until approximately four blocks later that it finally pulled over to the curb. And during that four blocks, did you notice anything going on inside the car that aroused your suspicion? Yes, sir, I did. It appeared that one of the occupants seated in the rear was attempting to hide something on the floor. Objection. Your Honor, the answer calls for a conclusion on the part of the witness as to what appeared to be taking place in the rear of the car. Now, he was obviously some distance away, and his vision was restricted to the area of the rear window. This would hardly qualify such a broad assumption on his part. Sergeant Friday, could you be more specific as to what it was you actually saw? Yes, Your Honor. I saw what appeared to be Defendant Andrews attempting to conceal something on the floor. He kept glancing back at us out of the rear window and then ducking down out of sight. When he finally settled back in the seat, Costa pulled to the curb. Did you base this conclusion on your experience as a police officer, Sergeant? Yes, Your Honor. Did you, in fact, find something concealed on the rear floor of the vehicle at the subsequent time? Yes, sir, I did. Objection overruled. You may proceed, Mr. Simmons. Sergeant, did you or Officer Gannon approach the defendant's car first? I was the first one out. I approached the driver's side and identified myself as a police officer. And what did you observe at that time? I observed the three defendants in the car. Acosta was driving, Williams was seated in the right front, Andrews was in the back. Did you have an occasion to look on the rear floor where you saw the suspicious activity going on? Your Honor, if it pleases the court, the defense objects to Mr. Simmons' last question. His reference to suspicious activity is pure supposition and does not even reflect the words of the witness. And in any event, Your Honor, has certainly not been established as fact. Your Honor, I think it's perfectly clear what the officer meant when he referred to what he saw through the rear window of the defendant's car. The fact that he investigated the rear floor certainly indicates that he was suspicious of something. Will the reporter go back and read the officer's statement with regard to what he observed prior to the defendant's vehicle being stopped? Mr. Simmons, and during that four blocks, did you notice anything going on inside the car that aroused your suspicion? Sergeant Friday, yes, sir, I did. It appeared that one of the occupants seated in the rear was attempting to hide something on the floor. Thank you. The objection to Mr. Simmons' last question is sustained. Will you rephrase your question, please, and proceed? Very well, Your Honor. Sergeant Friday, did you look on the rear floor of the car? Yes, sir, I did. And will you please tell the court what you found there, if anything? I observed a man's cloth jacket partially concealing what appeared to be an iron rod. Please continue, Sergeant. After I told the defendants to get out of the car, I removed the jacket and observed two lug wrenches partially concealed under the rear of the front seat. And did you personally inspect the victim's vehicles in the parking lot that night, Sergeant? I did. And in your opinion, as an experienced police officer, could the windows of those vehicles have been broken out by the lug wrenches? Objection, Your Honor. The answer calls for a conclusion. Overruled. You may answer the question, Sergeant. Yes, sir. It was a heavy object that broke the windows, possibly a lug wrench. Thank you, Sergeant Friday. Nothing further, Your Honor. Mr. Mongol, do you wish to cross-examine this witness? Thank you, Your Honor. Sergeant Friday, did you ask Mr. Acosta why he was carrying the two lug wrenches in the passenger compartment of his car? Yes, sir, I did. And did he tell you that he was carrying them there to check the lug nuts on his wheels from time to time because on a previous occasion someone had attempted to remove those wheels without his knowledge and that he nearly had an accident? Yes, sir. He said that someone was trying to steal his mag wheels and that he scared him off. Now then, did you tell him that he should keep the wrenches in the trunk compartment of his car and not in the passenger compartment where they could easily be mistaken for weapons? Yes, sir, I did. And he replied, did he not, that he could not put the wrenches in the trunk because earlier that evening he had loaned his car to a friend and when the keys were returned to him, the trunk key was missing. Yes, sir, that's what he said. And that made you suspicious, did it, Sergeant? No, sir, not really. Not until my partner found the missing trunk key in the suspect's pocket. Sergeant Friday, did you have a conversation with anyone in the parking lot other than the victims? Yes, sir. We spoke to the parking lot attendant. Isn't it a fact that he told you, for whatever reason, to be on the lookout for a car resembling that of the defendant's? Yes, sir. He described the defendant's car to us. Then when you and your partner left the parking lot, you were looking for a specific make, year, and color of automobile. Isn't that correct? It is. Then isn't it possible when you saw the defendant's car, it so nearly resembled the car described to you, and you were so intent on locating such a vehicle, that you were mistaken about the alleged violation? And in fact, the car did stop for the red light, but you felt you needed a reason to pull it over. Now, isn't that correct? No, sir, that is not correct. 
We saw the car slow down at the corner. We had a clear, unobstructed view. It did not stop. From a block away. Oh, I must say, Sergeant, I think the police department is wasting your talents. You should be working in the traffic division. Tell me, Sergeant, you were in a plainclothes unit, an unmarked car, were you not? Yes, sir, I was. And is it common practice when you're in such a vehicle for you to take enforcement action against traffic violations? No, sir, it's not. Thank you, Sergeant. That'll be all. You may step down. <laughs> At 3.05 p.m., Don Hale of SID was notified to come over to testify. Bill took the stand to tell the part he played in the arrest of the three defendants. Officer Gannon, I show you two common lug wrenches, the kind furnished with most of the new cars nowadays, and I ask if you can identify them. Yes, sir. They're the same two Sergeant Friday found sticking out from under the rear of the front seat of the defendant's car. They both have my initials scratched in them right there. Your Honor, may these items be marked People's 4 and 5 for identification. They may be so marked. Thank you, Your Honor. I have nothing further. Now, Officer Gannon, we've already heard Sergeant Friday testify that it was he who went up to the defendant's car first and told him to get out. Where were you at that time? Standing on the curb between the two cars. And did the defendants join you there? Yes, sir, they did. I had them stand where I could keep an eye on them while my partner checked the car out. You not only had them stand where you could keep an eye on them, but you searched them at that point, did you not? Yes, sir. As I recall, that's when I patted them down. Had you placed the defendants under arrest prior to patting them down, as you put it? Uh, no, sir, not at that time. We didn't arrest them until after we found the stolen stereo tapes and tape deck in the trunk of the car. Then the defendants were not under arrest at the time you searched them? No, sir, they weren't. Your Honor, the purpose of this line of questioning is to show the court the flagrant and wanton disregard the officers held for the rights of these defendants, not only by searching their person prior to any arrest, but also by conducting an illegal search of their vehicle. Did Gannon search them for weapons? Yes, sir, they were clean. The court has taken note of the testimony that's been presented, Mr. Mongol. However, it must be remembered the hour was late. Officer Gannon, was the purpose of your search to determine whether or not the defendants were armed? Yes, Your Honor, it was. The officers had the right to protect themselves under such circumstances, Mr. Mongol. As for the search of the vehicle, I think we should hear the rest of the testimony. You may continue, Mr. Mongol. Isn't it a fact that you're also looking for something else when you searched Mr. Acosta? I don't think I understand the question, Mr. Mongol. Well, let me put it this way. Did you find any weapons on the defendants when you searched them? No, sir, I didn't. But isn't it a fact that you did find the key to the trunk compartment of the defendant's car during that search? The same key Mr. Acosta honestly believed had not been returned to him. Yes, sir, I found the key, all right, but that's not what I was looking for. Well, tell me, officer, did you find anything either on the defendant's persons or in the passenger compartment of their car that was later proven to be stolen property? No, sir. Thank you, officer. Nothing further, Your Honor. 3.45 p.m., while Don Hale from Scientific Investigation Division took the stand, Bill called Mrs. Balanzi again. Carl still wasn't home. Our time was running out. Now, Mr. Hale, we've heard your qualifications as an expert chemist. Will you tell the court what kind of test you made? Yes, sir. I performed six comparison tests in all. Three on the glass fragments found adhering to the beveled edge here. Uh, let the record show the witness is pointing to the sharp edge of People's Four for identification, the part that would normally be used to remove hubcaps. And three more comparisons on the black paint samples that were taken from the broken windows of the victim's vehicles. Were you able to form a conclusion based on your findings? I was. And would you please tell the court what that conclusion is? As a result of the examinations described, I found that there was no appreciable difference noted in the samples compared. The glass fragments taken from peoples four and five and the paint samples found on the broken window glass definitely indicate that these two instruments, or two exactly like them, were used to break the windows of the victim's vehicles. Thank you, Mr. Hale. No further questions, Your Honor. Mr. Mungle? No questions, Your Honor. Witness is excused. Call your next witness, Mr. Simmons. Your Honor, as you know, the people intended to call Mr. Balanzi to the stand at this time, but I'm afraid he's not arrived in court as yet. The officers have talked with his mother, and she indicated to them that he left the town of Mojave shortly after noon today en route to Los Angeles. That's only a little over 100 miles from here, and he should arrive here at any minute. Your Honor, it seems to me that the prosecution has had ample time to present its case. The defense moves at this time that they either present this witness of theirs or allow the defense to present its side of the case without further delay. I think it's quite clear, Your Honor, from the testimony of the prosecution's own witnesses, namely the two officers involved in the arrest, that the defendant's constitutional rights were violated. The people have failed to show probable cause for stopping the defendants in the first place, basing this part of its case on an obscure traffic violation admittedly witnessed from a full city block away. And then, as if to compound this injustice, the defendants' rights were further violated when an illegal search was made, both of their person and their vehicle. 
One of you better give Balanzi another try. I can hold Mungle off for a few more minutes, maybe get us another recess. Your Honor, if it pleases the court, the people ask for a short recess at this time to see if Mr. Balanzi can be located. One of the officers has gone to call his home again. We should know in a few minutes whether or not he's returned. Your Honor, as I have just stated, the people have had more than enough time to present their case. Another recess would only serve to delay these proceedings. There is an alternative, Your Honor. I have here the original police report made by the officers at the time of the arrest. It contains the statement given to them by Mr. Balanzi on that night. I ask the court to allow that statement to be read into the record only for the purpose of establishing probable cause and subject to being struck at a later time when Mr. Balanzi can be produced. Your Honor, such a request is impossible. It violates the fundamental principles of the rules of evidence. A defendant before the court is entitled to be confronted by all witnesses offering evidence against him. Gentlemen, you've both presented a good argument that's placed the court in somewhat of a dilemma. The court has heard strong evidence that a crime has been committed, and it appears that Mr. Balanzi will be able to shed some light on who committed the crime. The court cannot, in good conscience, ignore this fact, and would not hesitate to allow the defense similar latitude should it find itself in this circumstance. Court will recess for 10 minutes. Four twenty-two p.m. Court was still in recess. There was no answer at the Balanzi residence. We called Lieutenant Walters at burglary auto theft, but there'd been no messages from Carl Balanzi or his mother. We would still try to reach the witness, but we were just about out of time. Any word? The officer will keep trying his house. They sent a team out to check around outside just to be sure. Man. No luck, Bob. Let's face it, Balanzi's not going to show. Mr. Simmons, is the district attorney ready to proceed? Your Honor, I'm afraid we've been unable to contact our witness at this time. The people rest. Your Honor, at this time, the defense moves for a dismissal. The charges brought against the defendants Ray Acosta, Marvin Williams, and Robert Andrews should be dismissed for lack of evidence and failure of the prosecution to show probable cause. From the evidence presented, the court feels the officers acted within the scope of their authority by stopping the defendants' cars they did. During this time, one of the officers testified that he noted something suspicious going on in the back of the car. This gave him the right to determine to his own satisfaction what that suspicious activity was. The officers also had the right to protect themselves by searching the defendants for weapons. However, without additional evidence on the part of the prosecution, it appears to the court that the officer's duty ended there. Under normal circumstances, the officers would not have confiscated the lug wrenches, even though it appeared that one of the defendants had tried to hide them. And the search of the defendant's persons was for the purpose of discovering whether or not they were armed and not for the trunk key they ultimately found. Therefore, gentlemen, it is the decision of this court that any evidence obtained beyond that point is inadmissible. The court is forced to grant your request, Mr. Mungle. Case dismissed. you have just seen is true. The names were changed to protect the innocent. In a moment, the conclusion. Raymond Acosta, Marvin Williams, and Robert Andrews were exonerated of all charges. Six months later, one of the suspects was arrested and convicted for first-degree burglary. Burglary in the first degree is punishable by imprisonment in the state prison for not less than five years. Mm -hmm.